Good morning, everyone. Virgo here. It is October 11th, 2019, and happy Friday to everyone. All right, so we are going to be doing something that you guys have been requesting, or many of you have been requesting, for a, quite a while now. Actually, since the Dead Fish Society put out information with regards to little exciting snippets on the um, actual court documentation, what is located within Sharon Tracy Gale Bay's docket. Um, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to go over each individual thing because many of you caught little aspects in that video of uh, specific documents but are questioning what those documents are for or what they mean so we're going to be going over that today now this is going to be a rather lengthy video unfortunately there's no way around that you guys because in order for me to explain each individual doc piece of documentation we have to go over each one but for those of you that want to know everything that is up to date in the Sharon Tracy Gale uh, court docket and most of what would be in Corey Pitt, DeCorey Pitt's docket, um, I need to go over each thing, and I will be doing that in this very video. Uh, so those of you that want to um, bookmark it and watch it later, uh, on and off, you know, because it may be kind of lengthy, I certainly understand that. Please feel free to do that. Um, for those of you that are questioning what this entire thing is about, I've had many of you come up and say, hey, I want to know what's going on with the Sharon Tracy Gale thing, what happened or what have you. There is a playlist all you need to do is go to the main Virgo Triad channel page, look under Sharon Tracy Gale Bay Fraud playlist, and it has every single thing that has occurred from the moment that these people were actually arrested, the reason behind why they were arrested, and every video that I've done from that point forward. All right, so moving forward, first of all, I want to thank the Dead Fish Society for sharing this documentation so that I could go about doing this. Uh, for those of you that haven't actually visited the Dead Fish Society channel, who is going over audio and other parts of the Sharon Tracy Gale uh, docket, I will link their channel in the description. Okay, moving forward, the first thing that we are looking at is the Sharon Tracy Gale uh, docket first page, or the latest page rather, which is the actual order to rescind her bench warrant. Now, what does that mean? Okay, so what that means is that she was arrested on September 15th, as you guys know, 2019, and on September 16th, she had to go in front of a judge. That judge had to rescind the actual bench warrant. When you get a bench warrant for a failure to appear to court, and then you either are arrested, you turn yourself in, uh, or somehow end up showing back up to court, that arrest warrant has to be rescinded on the docket. And that means that it, there is no longer an active warrant out for your arrest. So you don't have police departments out there looking for you since you're already in-house. Now, when they did the actual September 16th hearing on her failure to appear, what they ordered on here was that her bail was to be set at $100,000, and that is double from what her original bail was, which was $50,000. 10% of that, which would be $10,000, is what would be required in order for her to make bail. Now, many of you have had questions with regards to the original $5,000, which was 10% of her original $50,000 bail amount. All right, so there's a standing, there's a couple of standing rules in Pennsylvania courts that you guys need to know about. One, if you are not being tried for a capital punishment, or for a capital punishment, for a capital crime, like murder, for example, bail must be set. So the judge did not have the option in this case to remove bail off the table entirely. Number two, um, with the uh, bail being already paid once, the $5,000, which is 10% of that original $50,000 bail, there's a 30-day period where if that person is picked up on a bench warrant, comes back into um, court within a 30-day period out of 
whatever reason, whether they decide to turn themselves in, somebody else turns them in, um, or they're arrested, within that 30-day period, anything that was originally put up in terms of bail amount is on the books still, meaning that even though the bail, the, uh, bail was revoked, it does not mean that the bail was actually, um, uh, the bail was actually taken. Okay. So what this means is that there's no way to get the $5,000 back, but that $5,000 would go towards the 10% for the $100,000 because Sharon was picked up on day 28. I hope that explains that to you guys who have been asking questions. Now, we're looking at Sharon having to go back for this particular failure to appear on the 16th of October, which is next Wednesday, I believe, at 9 a.m. Now, this is separate. This is a separate trial or separate hearing having to do with this specific order for failure to appear. Her other trial, which has to do with all of the different things that she was pick, picked up for, is on the 15th of October at 9.30 a.m. So there's two separate things that are going on here. Um, this also says that there is a condition to her um, new bail. That condition being that she is not to be within one block of the North Harwood Avenue, Upper Darby, Pennsylvania address that she was removed from. It also appears that um, that this specific order might have to do with not just the failure to appear, but also the fact that there was trespassing involved because Sharon actually did break her um, contract with uh, the original, or not contract, but her um, conditions with the original $50,000 bail when she attempted to try to serve somebody with a fake lien who is now living in the property that she was removed from or on the same street as the property that she was removed from. So that is actually the trespassing charge. She was not being trespassed from the library. She actually uh, has a trespassing charge because she attempted to try to uh, serve someone documentation that was false on the North Harwood Avenue, Upper Darby, Pennsylvania street, which originally she had conditions saying that she could not go back there. Once again, these conditions have been placed upon this particular bond or uh, bail. And so that's what this is all about. Okay. And you see here it's signed by Frank Hazel, which is actually the judge that saw her the day after she was arrested and bail must be posted. There is $5,000 as a down payment that's showing on the docket for that specific bail, and um, another $5,000 would be required in order for her to, to get out on bail. However, she is getting ready to go to court and stand trial on the 15th, which is Tuesday, so that would be absolutely silly at this point, um, and then again on the 16th for her trespassing charge and failure to appear uh, stuff that's going on. All right, so what we're actually looking at now are the charges, the original charges. So we're going to be taking a look at that real quickly. For those of you that don't know what the F3, the M2, and all of that that you see uh, on here are, I'm going to be going over that with you. So count one, which is the most serious um, on here, or at least what leads to all the other serious ones, is risking catastrophe, which is a class three felony in the state of Pennsylvania. And that's what the F3 stands for, felony in the third degree, basically. Um, so this is showing you on or about 325, 2019, that risking catastrophe uh, is what was charged. And it shows you what class of uh, crime it is, which is the felony three. And then it gives you a short description and, of course, tells you what criminal code to look at to tell you what that is. Now, for those of you that have made statements with regards to um, the employment of fire explosives and other dangerous means, um, and that, oh, but she never, you know, you're thinking of it like um, uh, somebody set off a bomb, okay, and so there, if there was actually never a flame to set off the bomb, then it's not been employed. That's not true. Um, what we're looking at here is risking catastrophe, not actual catastrophe. 
Um, so what we are viewing is, for example, we know now that um, there were batteries and extension cords and wires all over the place leading to a generator and a propane tank, and it was causing an arc in the electricity to where they had to actually come in and carefully disconnect everything for fear that the house was going to blow up and take the rest of the neighborhood with it. Um, the outlets had been tampered with and it was creating a really serious scary scenario where potentially uh somebody working on the power lines of or something of that sort could have been blown right out of their basket in the air uh because of this arc that it was creating apparently uh with backing up into the electrical system so we are um now taking a look at the fact that uh employment means simply using anything that is a fire or explosive or dangerous of this sort. So for those of you that were saying, well, no bomb actually went off or anything like that, that is not what this means. Simply using something that is this dangerous um, for the means that she was using it for is considered risking catastrophe by almost textbook. All right, number two, recklessly endangering another person. This is a misdemeanor two. And what this means is, and okay, so let me just first stay, state that uh, felony three carries a certain amount of time. A um, misdemeanor two carries a certain amount of time. And so those things you can look up very uh, readily in the Pennsylvania Criminal Code, uh, just so that you know some, some of these things to, you know, six months to three years, three years to 10 years, 10 years to 15 years. So that's kind of the reason behind uh, that coding that you see. But anyway, uh, here we go. Recklessly endangering another person. And there are actually three counts of that, I believe. And of course, everything that's on here is also on to Corey Pitt's uh, docket. The reason behind this Many people are not aware Sharon was living in what's considered a twin home. A twin home shares a common wall, all right, meaning that the person who lived in the twin home next to Sharon had a wall in between the two of them that was connected together. That means that if anything happened to Sharon's home, including explosion, fire, or anything of that sort, that next door neighbor most certainly would have been harmed or killed because of it. Uh, so that's one thing to take into consideration. But then we also have to take into consideration that the actual county was called in. The, some engineers were called in, uh, electrical engineers, in order to uh, disconnect all of this because it was a bomb waiting to happen. So we're talking about an entire neighborhood, an entire block that could have actually exploded due to what they had rigged up in this home in order to get electricity we also are looking at um, three that have minor child on here. All right. So we had three children under the age of 18 that were in the home at the time. And according to all of the reports, which we will see in a little bit, um, those reports are showing that all of these batteries and explosive pieces of um, uh equipment were sitting next to things that were combustibles. So for example, uh, where they were able to uh, locate a lot of the batteries were sitting right next to a surface that was being used to heat up food. Really scary stuff, you guys. All right, so now there, we are looking at charges of five, six, and seven of endangering welfare of children by a parent or guardian. Uh, it's specifically more... Um, concerning and upsetting to the courts when you're dealing with a parent or a guardian who has custody of kids uh, and they're found to be endangering them in this way. Three separate counts on both dockets and all three of these are felony threes. Okay, here we go with the next charges, which are conspiracy of endangering welfare of children. That means there's two or more people, two or more parents that are involved in this conspiracy to agree to put up explosives in a property where there are minor children involved. And of course, there are three counts because there were three children. Then we've got the conspiracy of risking catastrophe. That's two or more people within the same property, of course, at this point. Uh, it even says criminal conspiracy to risking catastrophe with decorey pits, meaning that they agreed 
on setting up these explosive units in order to get electricity into the home and endangering not only the welfare of their three children, but everybody on the block in addition. Okay, for those of you that have been watching Scam Stingers, Van Balen, uh, Talisman, Virgo Triad Channel, uh, and you have heard over and over and over again these um, individuals claim, I do not wish to um, have joinder with you. Um, so here's the real meaning legally of what joinder is. This is the notice of proposed joinder under Pennsylvania Rule of Criminal Procedure, Rule 582. And you're going to notice here that they state, uh, this is from the prosecuting attorney's office, by the way, uh, or the district attorney's office. And it is uh, with regards to a statement saying that please be advised that the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania through the district attorney's office of Delaware County intends to try to gather any and all information contained in the following transcripts, that is Sharon Tracy Gale and DeCorey Pitts. In law, a joinder is the joining of two or more legal issues together procedurally. A joinder allows multiple issues to be heard in one hearing or trial and is done when the issues or parties involved overlaps, overlap excuse me, sufficiently to make the process more effective or fair, meaning that they're not going to try DeCorey and Sharon separately because this was a case where they actually were together in their agreement to put up these explosive devices and endangering their children themselves and everybody on the block. And as you can see, this was signed by the Delaware County District Attorney's Office. Okay, so next we're going to get into some of the crazy documentation because I'm going step by step here, guys, from most recent and further back. This was the last thing that we have that was filed by Sharon Tracy Gale. This is the Affidavit of Sovereign Personum Jurisdiction Invocation. Um, the docket has it down as invocation, which is incorrect, but I can see where she made the mistake here. This looks like a B instead of a V. Uh, it's kind of running together there. And here's the funny part about this. All right, so just so that you understand what personum jurisdiction actually is, it's personal jurisdiction. And it's used in civil cases, not criminal cases. Personum jurisdiction is, is the, here's an example. I have a disagreement with someone who did not pay me for an automobile. I am in California. The person who didn't pay me for the automobile all the way and who has possession of the automobile is in New Jersey. And that person, in order to, um, because they live in New Jersey, I am having to file the court case against them in the New Jersey courts because it is not reasonable for me to expect that they come all the way back to California or that they can come all the way back to California in order to go to court. So I, therefore, have to serve them where they are at. All right. So um, that's basically what personal jurisdiction is, or an example of it. Okay, so this is an affidavit of sovereign personum jurisdiction invocation, which means virtually nothing. What she's saying here is, I am Sharon Tracy Gale Bay, and all points, and all points in time. <laughs> no United States Service Corporation citizen has personum jurisdiction over the Aboriginal, Indigenous, Sovereign, Moorish, American nationals. It's a bunch of BS, number one, but number two, here is one of the funniest things. So the Moors like to talk about how the United States Service Corporation, uh, that they have proof in all of this through um, Secretary of State's office in Delaware and in other locations, according to them, that this makes the United States a corporation. But here's the real truth. There is a United States Service Corporation located in the state of Delaware. And that particular group or firm of individuals, what they do is they offer services to other states and foreign entities to be able to incorporate in the state of Delaware. Why is it that they want to incorporate in Delaware? Because there's special tax provisions if you incorporate your business in Delaware. But all they are is a firm who offers address and uh, service. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Ooh, sorry, you guys. Okay. <laughs> I had a coughing fit there for a minute. Okay. So all that, all that they are is a firm that offers services to assist companies to incorporate in the state of Delaware. The United States Service Corporation is just a company and it is, um, it is no different than any other corporation that's out there on the books. For for those of you that are not aware, you cannot incorporate uh, or put articles of incorporation under another corporation. Um, it doesn't work that way. So therefore, that nixes out the possibility of the country being a corporation anyway. But these people pretty much fall for anything. So... Um, you know, this is their supposed proof that the United States government is not really a country, but is a corporation of some sort. And even though there's proof beyond any kind of, <laughs> there, I mean, it's it's absolutely ridiculous. There's so much proof. And I, you guys see that I've done tons of videos on it, that the country is not a corporation. This is what they use to lie to their people. So that's what she's trying to say. She's bought it hook, line, and sinker, which is extremely sad. Uh, but anyway, nonsense paperwork. And here's a, here's another little, um, uh, here's another little antidote that will make you guys laugh. So when I called up to speak to the actual county clerk about this docket, what the clerk said to me was the minute she pulled the docket and started looking through the paperwork to try to find out the information that I was requesting, she says, oh my God, it's one of them. <laughs> but, <laughs> this is because the courts actually um, are very familiar with Moors that attempt to try to do this sort of thing. And if you guys would like to actually see the outcome on the on the um, latest cases with regards to this, take a look at the Virgo Triad channel's homepage and then go down to the playlist that's called Snoop for Truth. Now, in that playlist, you will see a video that is called What the Courts Think of the Moors. That video is priceless because it gives you case after case after case after case after case of where the Moors have attempted this kind of crazy filing stuff and have found themselves in even more trouble because they actually attempted it. Um, so anyway, the um, that uh, particular playlist will give you that video and it is absolutely hilarious when you get done looking at all of the different types of paperwork they've tried over the years. And it never, ever works. I have asked several of these Moorish American consulate Moors to come up with a case. Show me a case where this documentation actually worked. Because, you know, these are public knowledge. I mean, we, we can go into all kinds, PACER, all kinds of different databases. And um, just show me one. And no one ever can. So... It's really funny. Anyway, that's an open request to all of you uh, Mac Moors that are watching this or any of you that believe in this nonsense. Please show me a case, an actual case where it has worked. Uh, what they like to do is cherry pick cases and um, claim that things worked. And then when you get into the case, you find out that no, the case was dismissed upon something else entirely or the case has absolutely nothing to do with what they claim it does. Very interesting, um, <clears throat> very interesting how these people fall for this. But anyway, so here we go with more of the crazy documentation. This is the Affidavit of Fact Notice of Default Judgment, which why would you be speaking in the language of what you consider to be commerce when we are actually talking? <laughs> That's just absolutely insane default judgment. Okay, regardless, um, Let's take a look at what she's talking about here. This is actually her claim that the court does not have jurisdiction and that jurisdiction needs to be challenged and that, the, that her command, you know how she loves to command things, her command has not been honored and that jurisdiction has not been established. Therefore, this is a notice of default judgment and so on and so forth. I'm not going to read this whole thing because basically all this is saying is garbage. This is basically saying that the court that has, by the way, proven jurisdiction by the very fact 
fact that she's shown up and by the very fact that she's filing documentation and by the very fact that she's been incarcerated, um, that proves that they have jurisdiction over her. But she's still arguing it because that's all she knows to do. The funny thing is, is that the majority of the information that she is using here all comes from Taj Tariq. And Taj knows that none of this works. Taj has been a quote unquote claimed more <clears throat> um, since 1985. He himself has charges on his name. Um, even though they're only traffic violations that we've even been able to find, he still didn't get out of them. <laughs> you know, I mean, so the fact that Sharon is buying into this is absolutely insane. But yeah, that's that's just her thing. She goes into talking about the Constitution and all of these different things. Um, and uh, there's this is really quite funny. This is really quite funny. Um, for example, she goes into uh, talking about how uh, the they are the supreme law of the land and um, how every state shall be thereby bound by anything that the Constitution or laws say. And that's all fine and dandy if she was really talking about the actual Constitution. But what she's actually talking about is their own Constitution that they have kind of made up and rigged and, um, and tried to make it seem as though they are in charge of everything. And the reality is that no matter how much they might want that, um, what they're doing is actually considered something that is a crime, every single one of them. So you see people like the Sanjay L, whatever her name is, AL, and, you know, going off like a bomb. Well, we'll show you. We're going to get all of you. We're going to enslave all of you and all this other stuff. They really are, you know, buying hard for this. They really, really want this bad. Um, they have, they're full of hatred and they, they're, they're very upset. And, um, the majority of these individuals are so deeply embedded in this that they don't even bother to actually do any real research anymore. What they're now doing is looking at all Moorish sites that are false Moorish sites. They're sites that um, <clears throat> tell them what they want to hear at this point. It's really sad. Uh, for those of you that have not seen it yet, um, you should go over and take a look at the new Shalimar Bay video. It's hilarious, where he goes in to talk about how he's not the actual Secret Service guy. He's actually, um, you know, not that person at all, that there's somebody else. And he gives another guy that, that worked with him at the news channel that, you know, you can check with and all of this stuff. But he never mentions the fact that he was in government for quite a long time. As a matter of fact, he served directly under a governor um, and he was uh, the director of the Department of, uh, um, I believe it's Human Affairs or Public Affairs, um, and, and absolutely was in government. I mean, it's just crazy. But you guys will get a kick out of that because he claims that, you know, you need a consulate and all of this other stuff, but never, ever attempting to try to explain or even probably doesn't even know that consulates are for foreign countries foreign countries for people that are here um you know on visa or whatever they're 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 there for <laughs> foreigners and so they're agreeing that they are the foreigners then if they think that a consulate is going to work they also claim that there's no article three courts and what they're referring to really are common law courts and it's just insane absolutely insane you guys should take a look at it it's really a good laugh okay here we go so she sent courtesy copies of this to donald trump stephen mnuchin of the department of treasury mike pompeo <laughs> Uh, John Roberts. Yeah. So, you know, because Sharon is so all important that they're going to give a damn. Um, but anyway, that just shows the level of arrogance and ignorance that this individual has. Okay, here we go. Um, avertment of jurisdiction. And again, we're talking about the same thing here. She's quoting case law which is really hilarious because she doesn't even know what the case actually says. 
Okay, so we're going to be looking at delegation of authority. You guys have heard that also on all of these channels. Where is your delegation of authority? Show me your delegation of authority. So a dele delegation of authority is, let me give you an example. <laughs> they treat it or act as though it's some form piece of paper or something. But a delegation of authority simply means that you are entrusting another party, as we do when we elect a politician. Um, or it can be defined as a subdivision or suballocation of powers in order to achieve effective results. So um, we vote and we elect um, whoever. Trump um, or Clinton or, uh, you know, whoever, whoever, it doesn't matter. Um, they are being provided with delegation of authority at that point. So um, judges that are hired or elected, it's not a piece of paper, okay? Their delegation of authority is already there because we've given the rights for that to take place. Regardless, it doesn't matter because in Sharon's world, that's not the way things work. So um, she states, as all government entities and alleged private corporations must be a creature of the American Constitution, the American Constitution. This is a formal request and command for Delaware County Court of Common Pleas and Ann Burt. Baradaco and Richard M. Capelli, the judges, to produce for the record the physical documentation, physical documented delegation of authority as proof of jurisdiction. Okay, listen. <clears throat> they um, have you in jail and you are requesting physical documentation of delegation of authority, Sharon, that means you're recognizing them as actual um, authorities. You are in, you are recognizing their system and thereby agreeing that they have jurisdiction. I, I, you know, it's insane to me that these people think, oh, I can, I can, I can put my kids in danger. I can put the whole block in danger. Doesn't really matter. Um, <clears throat> You know, I, I don't stand trial for you. I, I'm not, you don't, you have no right to reprimand me whatsoever. I can do whatever I want. I can do whatever I want. <laughs> That's crazy. All right. Here she talks about being fined no more than $2,000 or imprisoned for not more than five years or both. <laughs> She's actually filing this with the very same judge that is going to end up sealing her fate one direction or the other. The arrogance and the, oh, and let's not forget, Fatima. Fatima. One of the people that's over on uh, the, uh, one of the channels that I exposed not too long ago, talking about how crazy Virgo Triad is. <laughs> But yet actually signing this documentation whereby putting her name right out there to be put on some kind of a watch list because of the fact that she is backing up this documentation, which means absolutely nothing. And as you can see uh, in a, a, a tilt of the hat to Heather Ann Tucci, which is currently serving her prison sentence, those wonderful red thumbprints. <laughs> Again. Courtesy copies went to Donald Trump, to Stephen Mnuchin, Mike Pompeo, John Roberts, Jeff Sessions, Arch, the Archbishop of Pennsylvania. <laughs> oh my gosh, look at all of these, you guys. Crazy. Okay. Uh, unbelievable. Okay. So this is a second copy quoting the same case, um, and this is the bill. <laughs> Woo! All right. <clears throat> Please 
you guys, I'm getting a cold. So please um, forgive my coughing and my my voice changes here. Um, I'm I'm obviously catching something. So, all right. Um, let's see. What do we have here? This is just kind of a willy-nilly video, you guys. I didn't actually put this together in any kind of a script. Um, so forgive me for taking a moment here. So this is actually, um, you know, notifying the docket and, and, and filing in the docket that the October 16th, 2019 um, hearing that will be held at 9 a.m. And they want the, uh, you know, attorneys to participate, of course. And, of course, she refused to sign it. Um, and she refused to appear. Uh, this is the reset of, or this is the set of the new hearing, but this was of the hearing from the 16th of September, where she refused to even go into the courtroom. She refused to appear in front of the judge. So that was when they were talking about actually upping her bail amount and all of these other things. Sharon refused to go. <laughs> I'll just sit in my cell. You guys just, you know, make up your mind. I'll sit in my cell. Okay. Here is the um, actual docket and the fact that she is actually held um, in county jail. This was the original one, like I said. So this was on the 25th of March. And at the time she was unable to post bail. That bail did originally uh, get posted. Whoops, it's upside down, but that's okay. Uh, the 10%, which is $5,000, it was done on the 18th, I believe, of April. So she sat there for several weeks before that was done. Let's get through this. Sorry, you guys. You guys have seen this all before. Um, all right, here we go. So now we're down to the actual criminal complaint. This is what the police filed. This is the original document uh, that was filed with the courts by the police department that actually went in with them when they were arrested. We're going to take a pretty decent look at this. Okay, here we go. So. So here we go with the, as as we see there, she filed a fake lien against Timothy Bernhardt, which is the arresting officer of the Upper Darby Police Department. So we know that that's accurate. And the documentation, excuse me, that was done um, is showing that he is accusing the above named defendant, which of course is Sharon, who lives at the address set forth, which is of course the Upper Darby Township on Harwood Avenue uh, with the um, criminal complaint. <clears throat> and of course, risking catastrophe is a felony three. And there's one of these for each specific offense. This is the amount of paperwork uh, that has to go into these police criminal complaints upon an arrest. So for every single one of uh, recklessly endangering another person, um, endangering children, the risking catastrophe, all of those had to be filed separately. So bear with me while I, okay, affidavit of probable cause, and here we go. On Monday, March 25th, 2019, at approximately 0604 hours, the Upper Darby Township Police Department assisted the Delaware County Sheriff's Department with an eviction at 36 North Harwood Avenue in the Kirkland section of Upper Darby Township. The Delaware County Sheriff's Department made contact with the occupants of the residence. They are now known as Sharon Gale, date of birth 12975, and DeCorey Pitts, date of birth 9177. Both reside at 36 North Harwood Avenue, Upper Darby, Pennsylvania. Both Sharon Gale and DeCorey Pitts were found to have active warrants for their arrest, at which point they were placed into custody and transported to police headquarters. The Delaware County Sheriff's Department advised the property at 36 North Hartwood Avenue was in deplorable condition and posed numerous health and safety hazards. The property had no electricity and the occupants 
circumvented the main water valve to obtain water for the property. Due to the conditions of the property, both the fire department and the Upper Darby Township Department of Public Health were called and responded to the property. Again, while inside of North Harwood Avenue, officials observed inside the kitchen and down the cellar steps numerous large vehicle batteries. Those batteries were being used to provide electricity and charging stations for the entire home. Also, in the kitchen area was a propane tank being utilized as both a heat source and a source for cooking. The illegal hookup of these batteries throughout the main floor and the cellar steps, particularly those in the kitchen were placed in areas close to other combustibles, which posed serious safety and fire hazards. Inside the property, there were numerous extension cords that ran through the house, supplying power to various outlets inside of the home. These extension cords were excuse me, power sources for the property. Located on the property inside the garage was a generator supplying power to the home's main electrical box. This process is known to supply power back outside, causing a great danger to any and all utility workers working on power lines. Based on the opinion of both the Upper Darby Township Department of Public Health and the Upper Darby Township Deputy Fire Chief, it's the opinion that the property's occupants, Sharon Gale and DeCorey Pitts, placed themselves, their three children, and neighbors in the unit block of North Harwood Avenue, Upper Darby Township, in extreme danger and grave risk of serious bodily injury. North Harwood is a twin home, which is attached to 38 North Harwood, Upper Darby, Pennsylvania. The Delaware County Sheriff's Department secured the property and posted a no, no trespassing sign on the front door and then of course he uh does his uh you know duly signed and affirmed and all of that uh and this is the signature of the actual police officer so this has been talked about a little bit over on the dead fish society's channel i've also spoken about this criminal complaint by the police department a couple of times on my channel but just so that everybody is aware so there were already active warrants out on both sharon and to Corey at the time of their um, arrest they were not arrested um just because uh as claimed by the mac they were arrested because they had active warrants but then in addition to that they were arrested for literally risking catastrophe uh as you just heard there were numerous excuse me car batteries that were running up and down the stairs with extension cords attached to propane tanks next to combustibles there were three minor children uh in the property and of course her home as stated is sharing a wall with another twin home uh, right next door. So putting the entire block in uh, along with any utility workers in serious danger due to the um, current uh, that was an issue. And as I said, I'm, I'm not an electrician, so I don't really understand how all of that works. But my understanding is that uh, this was some sort of a backup that was occurring. And as a result of that, uh, could have caused a really, really serious uh, explosion or um harm to come to many many people located within a block of that area all right moving down a little bit further here okay you guys i'm sorry about that but i had to skip to the next page because i do not believe in doxing people in the manner that some other groups of individuals attempt to try to do and personal information like social security numbers and so on and so forth are something i am absolutely not going to put out there so the previous page was just about verifying personal information this is the waiver of counsel as you guys probably are already aware it speaks for itself it's the waiver of counsel it says that she's been informed that she has the right to a lawyer that she understands the nature of the charges that she's aware of the possible range of sentences or fines the offenses could incur that she understands that she uh wa even if she waives the right to counsel that she'll still be bound by all of the regular regular rules and procedures of the court um and she of course refused to sign this not that it really matters because the very fact that she wrote refused on it and her name on all of these things actually being signed off on the by the judge states that um she knowingly and voluntarily um actually understands the waiver and is being granted 
the right to um, be her own attorney, basically. She also, I believe, uh, no, I, I know that she was looked at to make sure that she was competent to stand trial. So she's in it now. Okay, application for continuance. And um, so let's see, this was, I believe, a request to continue simply for a continuance simply because they wanted to look at discovery trying to see whether that is the case yeah there was a continuance based on the fact that discovery needed to be uh, reviewed and here's this is funny all rights reserved under duress threat and coercion. So um, for those of you that don't know, you keep hearing this uh, crap about uh, all rights reserved under duress and all of this other stuff. Um, being under duress is something very specific. Um, generally means uh, the threat of bodily harm or death. <laughs> it's always really funny to me that they make that statement. Okay, so now one of the things that the Dead Fish Society already has gone over with you guys, and if you haven't seen it, again, use the link in the description and you will find it. This is the bail bond. Um, the person who actually bar bailed Sharon out um, ended up being a party that became responsible for her. And I'm not even sure that they were aware that that was going to be the case when they actually bailed her out. So, as you can see, April 12th, um, this is the signature of the party that bailed her out. Um, he put up 10% of the $50,000 bond, which was $5,000. And um, Sharon signed it here. But then, let's see, this is the additional requirements, by the way, where she agreed to all of these things, including showing up to court. And um, including the fact that she would not go back to the Harwood address, which was a condition. So, um, <laughs> crazy. Oh, my gosh. Okay. And she refused to sign this. Um, and you see that this was the condition to get a uh, competency evaluation. The competency evaluation um is something that was ordered and is ordered on a regular basis for people who claim that they want to represent themselves because they want to make sure the judges want to make sure that their rights are not being violated that they understand everything that they're not mentally handicapped to the point that they cannot effectively understand what's going on in the proceedings um and thereby having their case thrown out because of that fact, which is, I think, where this originally started. Okay, so here we go with the actual bond. I'm sorry, you guys. There's all of this actual documentation that goes into this. You know, all the conditions have to be signed for uh, so that she understands what she can't do, like going back to her original um, Harwood Avenue address and filing false liens against people and stuff, which she did everything that she wasn't supposed to do. All right, so monetary conditions in the amount of $50,000, the conditions of the bail bonds are here again. Um, the issuing authority signed this, um, uh, stating that that they're verifying the above conditions of bail have been imposed upon her. She refused to sign here again. And then, um, oh gosh, I'm missing that whole page, you guys. I'm sorry. We'll come across it anyway. The one, the guy that, I, that actually signed for it, um, I don't know whether he realized it or not, but what he was actually signing himself into was being 100% responsible for the fact that she was going to show up to court and that she was going to do everything that she claimed um, or she was going to stay away from the Harwood address, everything that's on the actual bail conditions, he became responsible for. So if she didn't do those things, as you saw she didn't, he became responsible, meaning that they could actually pick him up too. Something that you guys need to be aware of if you ever go and, and actually get um, anything other than a bail bondsman, and even if you go with a bail bondsman, um, you're signing your name over to be responsible. 
for whatever the conditions are that's on the bond. So be very cautious and make sure you understand it thoroughly. Okay, this is a question that I had just so that you guys understand this particular piece of garbage that she filed um, thoroughly. This is basically saying that this is from the Moorish American Consulate Court, which is they're claiming an Article Three jurisdiction court. Okay, um, they are saying that um, that they're requesting the removal of a bill of attainder. What a bill of attainder is, is it's an act of legislation that's declaring a person or a group of people that, it's, that are guilty of a crime and then punishing them. So once again, this has to do with um, like the statement that, hey, we're dealing with this. Uh, Y'all don't need to deal with this. So we're requesting that you remove these Kate, she's calling them contract cases, these docket numbers, um, and these bills of attainder that you have um, claiming that these people are, um, that you have the right to try them of some crime and punish them. And that's what this is all about. Um, again, here's her little um, grounds of removal. Her grounds of removal are simply the fact that she is a Muslim, Moor, Aboriginal, Indigenous, Moorish American National, and a natural divine freeholder of the land of America. I domicile in the jurisdiction of my ancestral inherited estate at all times. All of my rights are reserved at all times where I hereby ex exercise them now. And da 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 da. So again, another fancy spell that she thinks will work. Uh, some crap out of the Black's Law Dictionary, which again is just a dictionary. Um, and, of course, never worked. As we see, she's sitting in jail right now. Um, here's more information where she claims, and I'm, I'm going to, you know, just shorten this up for you guys, that she's relinquishing every public office in the United States. So she's pulling apart everything. Um, she's stopping all, um, all state, uh, you know, any like officers have jurisdiction here and courts have jurisdiction here and um and i'm stopping it all that's what she's doing um she's claiming that charges are false which is a bunch of bs there's a ton of evidence um but even still it would not matter this paperwork is garbage it means nothing there is no moorish american consulate um it's not recognized and because of that it means nothing here she talks about dummy straw man uh, franchises, and of course she believes the uh, crap about there being some straw man account and crazy squirrel trust, and um, you know we've seen it a million times before. And then of course she provides the proof of service. <laughs> let's see, let's see. Did she? Um, yeah, removal to the Moorish American Consular Court, where she's a judge, so they want, so supposedly, they're supposed to just say, oh yeah, here, we'll hand this over to this kangaroo court that you guys pretend to be, and we'll just wave it and say, oh, forget it, we owe the citizens of um, the Commonwealth nothing for the fact that you almost blew up or could have blown up a block, um, a city block. It's just insane. Um, okay, and then here we have, now this, this, this is embarrassing. Um, with regards to somebody who used to work within our government, um, Light Tajiri Bay, also known as Pauline, um, uh, Richie Moore, the sister of Shalimar Bay or Mark I. Richie signing away this as though it means something. Someone who was supposed to be an educated enough woman to work for the government in prosthetics and um, who's written books and everything else, um, signing away on this ridiculousness. Unbelievable. They talk about the uh, Treaty of Peace and Friendship and all of these other things that mean nothing pertaining to any of this. All right, another copy of the a court docket, which they file a new one every time something is changed. Here we go with the person who actually posted bail for Sharon. Sadly, that person um, was screwed. I feel rather badly for that person because I think they believed in what they were doing and thought that it was going to be something that was helpful. 
Um, I think a lot of people that are good people got duped into this Moorish American consulate stuff um, and aren't necessarily um, people that are threats of any sort, but just simply believed that they had been, uh, that what where they had been misled was earlier in, t in a time frame of their life and that they really honestly believed that they were not told the truth by the actual government and thereby were trying to learn and then found out abruptly that uh, <laughs> none of this is true at all. And this is all just documentation that has to do with the proof of service. <laughs> I mean, one of the things that they love to do is gum up the system with paperwork. So here we go again with the religious corporation affidavit of organization, the temple of the moon and the sun. Um, you know, this all has to do with um, the uh, claim that the, what is it called? The constitution of the Zodiac or Zodiac constitution or whatever. It is um, copywritten, and this is the copyright number, and they try to use this as a tax ID number, um, which will catch up to them eventually, because now it's being widely spread. Again, signed by Light Tajiri Bay. What a shame. You should be ashamed of yourself. Unbelievable. Again, proof of delivery of all of this stuff, just garbage, 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 just to gum up the system, which is what, by the way, Taj Tariq Bey is really after. He really is after money because of the scam. He really is after trying to gum up a government system that he does not like. Um, being anti-government is something that uh, all of these people that started this craziness back in the 70s and 80s have in common. Um, from the Sovset group to the different militias that are out there to um, the Moors that are not part of Moorish Science Temple, but really are just um, people that like to use that name in order to try to use it for the purpose of breaking the law and being affiliated with a religious group. Now, my understanding is Taj was at one point a Temple Moor and was in one way or another had a disagreement and is no longer, has not been one for a very, very long time. All right, here we go is a copy of the um, Moorish uh, Quran, Quran. And again, just gumming up the system with a bunch of garbage. For the public record, let's see, what is this? Affidavit of the National Trust. Now, here we go with real crazy town, y'all real crazy town. Now we are talking about the claim that there is some sort of public trust. And as you can see, this is from the Moorish National Republic federal government, which is a bunch of garbage in addition. Now, there are people that like to claim that people like this Jamal Flicks guy that we've talked about on my channel where he's teaching gun how to, you know, unload and load weapons and clean them and, and talks about where to hit somebody um, directly on their body so that it kills them. All these different things that he talks about. Uh, this is a person who claims to no longer be with the Moorish American consulate, but instead be with the Moorish National Republic federal government. Okay, they're two heads of the same snake, all right? These these two groups are, are not different. They still preach the same hate. They still talk about the same gar garbage. They still claim that they're, uh, you know, people that are um, above everyone else and... Uh, that, you know, you are slaves to them and all these other things. Same difference. Uh, there's, this is something that was gone over already. This is from the Library of Congress. Um, and this is a claim that the documentation that, that I just showed you guys was not that one, but this information uh, with regards to the Holy Quran and, and all of these different things are in the Library of Congress, which is actually, I believe, the peace treaty that they are referring to. The public statutes at large of the United States of America, Volume 8, attach the photocopies. Yes, okay, so all the photocopies that you guys just saw. Now, the funny part about this is that um, apparently, uh, here we go. This is the stuff. Apparently, um, this isn't even locatable anymore. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, regardless, this is um, 
the, yeah, Treaty of Peace and Friendship. So, I don't know why it wouldn't be uh, locatable anymore, because this is an actual treaty that took place. Um, you know, it's still in effect in terms of their the actual articles that are written here. Nothing in here says anything about uh, that North America is Morocco. Uh, all this is basically about is about, uh, you know, how to protect one another. Uh, it talks about the ships and um, how, you know, they're going to... America or the United States and Morocco were going to protect one another in terms of being allies uh, from pirates and this sort of thing. Uh, it's absolutely ridiculous that anybody would actually believe that this somehow states that America is Morocco. Okay, sorry about that, you guys. I got confused on that documentation. Okay, there's so much of it after all. <laughs> um Again, more garbage, affidavit of notice of consulate and orders to honor the sovereign status of Moorish Americans. <sighs> they have the same sovereign status as everybody else does, you guys. And as you can see, here we go with Taj Tariq Bay. And General Shalimar Bay. Shame. Shame on you. Listen to this, you guys. This idiot. This idiot, and I say idiot now because you're looking like an idiot, Mark, uh, Richie, and your sister. You both look like total idiots. Having your name on any of this stuff is absolutely ridiculous. All right, so this educated man who actually worked in our government in 2002 and 2003 as the director of public affairs in, in, uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. <laughs> you have your crazy uh, name of Shalimar Bay on here as though you are actually the co consular general. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. You need to read what an actual actual consul is. What an actual actual con, uh, consular court is, because it is not something. If you are claiming, you can't claim that that you are um, foreign if you're claiming that this is not foreign land to you. And if you're claiming that it is foreign land, so therefore you need a consulate court, then you uh, are agreeing to the fact that you are the foreigner. You can't have it both ways. You can't have it both ways. Shame on you for misleading people for the purpose of money, because that's exactly what all of you, Taj Tariq Bay, Shalimar Bay, and Light Tajiri Bay, that's what all of you are doing and you've gotten your own people you're selling out your own group of people to jail to prison which is exactly what you have done with sharon shame on you it's disgusting all of this has their names all over it they so proudly announce that they're the heads of these things and yet they are selling you right back into slavery by sending you to prison unbelievable by the way if there's such a powerful consulate why is it that sharon is sitting in jail why is it that decorey pitts is sitting in jail why is it that nine others that i've counted so far are sitting in jail look at this authenticated by the two of them here there's here's their signatures what a disgusting group of people what a disgusting group of people faxed out <laughs> this is what it, it was faxed to the courts you guys this is showing where bail was actually posted on the 18th as i said of april and maybe now we'll get to the actual bond that was uh actually signed let's see if we can find it Again, look at all of this. I have read this information. I acknowledge that my personal representative successors, heirs, ass uh, assigns are jointly and 
severely bound with Sharon T. Gale and other sureties to pay the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania the sum of $50,000, which is the full amount of the monetary condition of release in the event that the bail bond is forfeited. So it was revoked, but not forfeited, which is why there's a $50,000 uh, down payment right now. And this is the signature of the person who actually um, bonded her out. Oop, didn't want to show that. <clears throat> okay. Again, the person um, who bailed her out. I agree to act as a surety and sign the bail bond with the defendant. I understand that I shall be liable for the full amount of bail if the defendant fails to appear. He didn't have to sign that. He could have signed that I do not want to be liable for the full amount of bail. But he didn't. He became part of the surety. Really sad. Okay. So here we are now at the point of um, just repeating. Now we're just repeating things. These are just copies. So I'm going to go ahead and leave it here, you guys, just so that you're all aware of what the actual documentation means, what it says, what they've uh, got in the docket. Um, and But I wanted to make sure I addressed it because you guys have been asking questions about it. And so hopefully this helped you guys to understand uh, what each document is. And I appreciate you taking the time to listen to this video. We will be taking a look at Sharon's case once again on Tuesday after she goes to her uh, first day of trial. I would imagine, I would not expect that this is going to take less than, a, you know, a couple of different um days. I, I think that she's going to be in court more than one day. I could be wrong, but because they are dealing with two people, they're dealing with John, not just Sharon, but also to Corey Pitts. But we will immediately be looking at any kind of changes that take place on the docket. And I've got a couple of people who have not gotten back to me yet as to whether or not they're going to be able to actually show up in court. I hope that they do. If they do, we will get a play-by-play -play, kind of the same way that we did um, <laughs> my anger birds um kind of the same way that we did uh with the heather ann tucci trial but i don't know for sure whether or not that's going to be something that takes place um so i will let you guys know as soon as i know and i hope everybody has a wonderful weekend everybody take care